This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 479, recorded on February 2nd, 2018. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, Vincent. How are you? Minus two Celsius and cloudy here in New York City. Is that right? We got uh, 54 uh, Fahrenheit, which is 12 C, and I would say kind of kind of hazy, but pretty bright. Chilly for me. You know, I go outside my bare feet and my T-shirt and... I don't want to stay very long. <laughs> t-shirt, t-shirt. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. It's uh, cloudy here today. Little bits of sun poking through. 19 Fahrenheit, minus 7 Celsius. And from western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's, um, let's see, the wind is blowing out of the west at 22, gusting to 31 knots. Got clear Ooh. skies. Um, and uh, temperatures minus 4 Celsius, dew points minus 13. Hmm. Hmm. A little bit of mixed up weather here all across the U.S. Dixon will be with us later. Later today, we will give away a copy of Neurotropic Viral Infections. So, no work was involved. And we got. <laughs> 20 some responses, including no, some no sweats were broken in the making of this podcast, <laughs> in, including 20, uh, a few uh, crossword puzzle, incomplete, but you know, attempts. But I threw them in the pot because what, you know? Sure. Why not? So uh, stay tuned. Stay tuned till the very end. Now, Rich, we have some follow up, and Rich will be first. Okay. So I've had a. Uh Significant correspondence with uh, a number of people, including uh, Clarissa, who authored one of the reviews that we looked at and was a co-author on the Mulford paper. This is all relevant to the last episode uh, on cowpox. And Dave Evans, the uh, author of the uh, synthetic horsepox sequence paper and some others. And it, uh, you know, expands a little more and a little more, uh, a couple of more thoughts and answers some questions. First of all, I misspoke when I said they used fragments of up to 10 KB. In fact, they had uh, synthetic fragments for the s synthesis of horsepox that were up to 30 KB. Uh, and I looked into a little more of this. It's not like you make a 30 kilobase oligonucleotide. You make a bunch of, the companies make a bunch of smaller oligonucleotides and that overlap and then use uh, mostly PCR-based techniques to zip them together, and they're provided to the investigators as uh, cloned molecules. And I even asked Dave, because I've had experience with big cloned molecules. I handled a, made and handled a Cosmid library for a long time. It was a pain in the rear because they're really, you don't get much DNA, and they're not very, very stable, and they spit out big chunks. And I asked Dave if anything has changed. He says, nope, still a big pain <laughs> in the rear. <laughs> um. Uh, the question came up is uh, how much it cost, and it's about $100,000 uh, just for the sequence. That doesn't the, the oligos, include. The oligo? Yeah. yeah, yeah, to get the to get the sequence made. Mm. Wow. Um, oh, I also, uh, uh, one of my correspondents said, uh, eh, 30 KB, no big deal. You know, that could, we, because said we sounded like, you know, awestruck that you could make stuff uh, that big uh, and said that that capability has been around for a while. Well, Okay, we're maybe just so. yokels. Luckily. Yeah, we're just yokels. And I must say that I, uh, some time ago, I spoke to Dave Evans about this, and he's, you know, gotten into this. He's been to synthetic biology meetings uh, and stuff, and he said, you know, two hundred KB to make a pox virus, shh, that's child's play. You know, <laughs> these guys, uh, that's just tinkering around. Um, <clears throat> the question came up as to why there were the two restriction sites. Kathy, you asked that. Mm -hmm. And there are two miscellaneous restriction sites that they built into the genome. And Dave said they're in the uh, uh, F4 homolog, which is uh, a subunit of the ribon – it's the small subunit of the ribonucleotide uh, reductase. And uh, Dave's done uh, other work showing that knocking that out restricts uh, vaccinia growth in rapidly growing cells. And it makes uh, a good oncolytic uh, – that makes a good oncolytic virus. And so he figured they'd just stick – 
those sites in there so that people could uh, tinker with that gene if they wanted to use the virus that they've made for uh, use in oncolytic research. Aha, cool. I, I had some um, interesting correspondence with uh, Clarissa where uh, we were going back and forth about the fact that um, this idea that the best virus, Jenner's idea that the best virus started from horses and went through cows. And she was saying, you know, there was a, a problem in getting vaccine. All Everybody complained about it uh, to, you know, because both horses and cows get a lot of blistering diseases. Um, and so they had things that they would call spurious cowpox, which is probably something that looked like cowpox, but if you tried to use it as a vaccine, it didn't work well. And uh, Clarissa was suggesting that maybe, you know, stuff that went from horses through cows, that sort of screening, uh, screened out spurious smallpox. Mm. In particular, stuff like parapox viruses, which, you know, will look all for all the world like pox viruses, but they have a, a more a stricter host range. So if it goes from the horse to the cow, through the cow, you're selecting for something that has uh, a broader host range and reproducibly uh, be behaves like a, like a horse slash cowpox virus. So I thought that was an interesting idea. Um, and I was thinking a little more about this question of, uh, you know, there seems to be, at least according to the discussion we had, very little evidence of any cowpox uh, in the vaccines. The closest ancestor is horsepox and cowpox is this, um, <clears throat> you know, other arm on the phylogenetic trees. But thinking about it more and looking into it more, uh, I, I recalled that there have been studies on cowpox saying, that, you know, cowpox is not all just the standard cowpox bright and red. And there have been a number of studies in the past few years looking at cowpoxes showing up in Europe to suggest that there's actually quite a lot of variation and there are actually clades, um, uh, groups of phylogenetic groups of cowpoxes that are not as related to each other. And one of these clades is actually closer than some of the traditional cowpoxes to vaccinia. So in, in the end, if, even though horsepox still is the closest. And all, recall that we only have one horsepox sequence. So when horsepox was prevalent, who knows what the variation in that might have looked like. So it's, it may not be, in my mind at least, this is just me talking, quite as black and white as we, as we painted it. Certainly there's a strong case for horsepox being uh, an important ancestor of uh, the vaccinias. And my guess is that there's a lot of evolution that's gone on if you read those reviews in the hands of humans. But I wouldn't rule out that cowpox has played a role in this, especially when you consider the variation uh, in cowpox. Bottom line for me, <laughs> vaccinia is a mutt, you know? <laughs> <laughs> However, there, the were, show title. there were still cows involved and there were still milkmaids. Yeah. So I have no problem with the word vaccine. Right. <laughs> and that brings us to uh, an email from Niraj. Hi, folks. Listening to the latest TWIV, wanted to send the following link your way, a brief article in Science, um, why the word vaccine is probably all wrong and... Um, Maybe vaccine needs to be updated. Thanks for the discussion. There was a similar article in NPR where they said, were there really milkmaids? You know, and that's not the point of, did you read either <laughs> either NPR or science? Did you actually read the original article? Uh, the cows were involved. Milkmaids were involved. Yeah, we have a picture well, of a milkmaid's it's... hand. It's not, cows were definitely a big part of it. So why say vaccine is wrong? It's ridiculous. Well, there it's. Why it's did a I mind. know you were going to argue with me on this? Yeah, because <laughs> he's a journalist. This is a correction, you know. It's it, vaccine is the right word, and of course it is, and it's not going to change. Not and point. I don't think anybody expects it. And, to. If, and I understand that this is how you grab people and get them in, but I don't like it. I just don't like it. <laughs> By the way, we had I left out uh, one thing. We had uh, an email from uh, Jose Esparza as well that made a a couple of interesting points. He was. Uh, he was pleased that we uh, pointed out that Jenner's original observations were made, you know, before anybody knew what a virus was. And he pointed out that, you know, it was even darker than that. This was before germ theory. 
So this was entirely empirical. These, yeah, it's pretty cool. These guys and they didn't even, know what they were doing. They even talked about infection, right? Yeah. That, it's, that uh, idea. There's, there's very, really good. very interesting. Yep. Um, and the, the other thing he pointed out, we mentioned um, uh, the – in, in, in the story that Derek Baxby uh, had written this uh, book uh, originally suggesting that maybe it was uh, uh, horsepox, not cowpox. And uh, Esparza had written, mm. read that shortly after it was published, like 20 years ago. And when he got the sequence of the Mulford strain, he um, contacted Baxby to tell him that he was right, okay? <laughs> And Baxby had died two years, mm -hmm. I mean, two two weeks earlier, okay? But he was able to tell his family. So I thought that was cool. Uh, from Anthony in TWIV478, there was mention of vaccine produced in the past on farms in Clifton and Patterson. I wonder if in Clifton, production was related to the U.S. animal quarantine facility that was located there. And he sends a link to a document, National Register of Historic Places, it's a nomination form from 1981. And this is um, describing some buildings in Clifton, 27 buildings, uh, where they kept, among other animals, cows. It's quite interesting. Hmm. So maybe, I don't know, could be. Where on earth did Anthony come up with that? <laughs> on earth. <laughs> he also okay. sent another link. <laughs> it's got a cool map. Oh, yes, it's very cool. Yeah. I wonder if they're still there. I don't know. It's right up against the Clifton High School. Hmm. Another article he sent in the stories from the National Museum of American History. It's a blog called Oh Say Can You See. This is an article about anti-vaccination in America. And they have uh, a picture of Mulford's, of pins that Mulford's vaccine company issued, I guess. <laughs> I am vaccinated with Mulford's vaccine, are you? <laughs> In Mulford's like vaccine. those, I got my flu shot. <laughs> That's right, and I mm -hmm. love them. They're great, and it's a good article too about. Yeah, it's a very good article. The history of uh, anti vax So, Rich, is this some kind of shield that they put over the I verification don't know. site? You know, maybe you know if we could. I don't know. And I'm trying to figure looks, out. You know, it looks like it's threaded, but then, so how does that work? Yeah. I, uh, unless that goes, that whole thing goes around your arm or something like that. Yeah. Hmm. I, noticed but, uh, the, I noticed the first few letters of Patterson there on the bottom of that. Isn't that cool? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, we'll yeah. The shield protects sore arm, prevents sore arms. Yeah. Okay. So that's what those shields are. Hmm. Maybe. Well, we could use a Band-Aid today, right? Yes. Yeah, but this looks more substantial. It's big. In protection. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Alan, can you take the next one? Uh, so we're up to Alexandra. Alexandra, yeah. Dear Twiv, I am a new Twiv listener, and I've loved listening to you all on my daily commute. I worked a bit with viruses during my undergrad and have since been doing malaria research, but have been keeping up with the world of virology thanks to Twiv, and I'm now thinking about doing my PhD in a virology lab. I really enjoyed this week's episode, 478, on the history of smallpox vaccine. The confusion surrounding which virus makes up the vaccine and confers protection against smallpox got me thinking about cross-reactive antibodies and reminded me of the story of two Polish doctors who exploited this phenomenon to fake a typhus epidemic during World War II to save Jews from getting sent to concentration camps. Eugene Lazowski and Stanislaw Matulowicz injected people in their village with Proteus vulgaris, a bacterium whose worst symptom is the occasional UTI. Infection with Proteus causes the production of cross-reactive antibodies against Rickettsia prowazekii, the causative agent of typhus. This leads to a fake false positive blood test for typhus. After being sent blood samples, the Nazis were convinced of the epidemic and the town was quarantined to stop the spread, thus sparing an estimated 8,000 people from being sent to concentration camps. At one point, when the Nazis grew suspicious due to the lack of, de of deaths, they paid the town a visit, and the doctors arranged the sickest-looking people who could all produce positive blood tests for their visitors to inspect. The inspectors did not get very close for fear of infection, and the epidemic was deemed legitimate. I think this is an awesome story, even if it is about bacteria and not viruses. The doctors published an article about this in an ASM newsletter in 1977 that I haven't been able to track down, but I did find a short BMJ article from 1990 and a blog post in Discover Magazine that tell the story nicely. Thanks for all you do. Best, Alex. And I, 
I saw some. I may I may have seen the Discover Magazine post about this because this sounds familiar and it is a very cool story. Yeah, I think this came up on Twim some time ago. Also, it's very interesting. Yep. Yes, it's a great story. All right, now the next one's from Islam, and he begged me to have this read, and I didn't really want to, but I like Islam, so <laughs> someone read it. Uh, Rich, can you read it, please? Sure. Hang on. i got to get down to it. I've been looking up uh, vaccine shields. Islam writes, <laughs> uh, and i got a picture of some. They're good. Um, Dear Twivome, I'm writing this letter to all the Twiv listeners out there and hoping that it will get read on time. The Keck Futures Initiative, a program of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, is currently seeking nominations for the 2018 Communication Awards for individuals or teams who have developed creative, original works that address issues and advances in science, engineering, and or medicine for the general public. Winners will be awarded $20,000 and honored at a ceremony during fall in Washington, D.C., <clears throat> I guess, since you are listening to this letter right now, you don't need a lengthy introduction, and you probably agree with me that such an award is very well deserved for TWIV and all the other sister microbe TV podcasts. Now we for, don't almo <laughs> for almost 10 years, <laughs> Professor Rankin Yellow and all of his wonderful co-hosts <clears throat> have been tirelessly producing these jewels of knowledge with very limited resources and no financial gain. Their reward is spreading their knowledge and infecting us with their genuine passion for science. In one of Twiv's, uh, in one of the Twiv's recorded at Tufts, I witnessed Professor Rack and Yellow carrying his podcasting gear like his baby and putting it together like a piece of art. In another Twiv recorded at ASM Microbe 2017, he was sitting in a corner with his earphones on, editing the soundtrack to get it released at the usual time on Sunday morning. Where does this guy get all of his passion? He sometimes does it three times a week. My God. And it is not just him. He has an impressive, like-minded group of expert colleagues who would set, uh, set there for a, few good, uh, for a few good hours and prepare for the weekly show and then for about two hours to record it. Uh, do you... Uh, no. Do you, uh, do you know how much dedication it takes to do this for 10 years nonstop? I can keep going on forever, but I will cut it short for now and get down to my main point of my letter. It is our turn to show a gesture of support and appreciation. Nominations for the National Academy's Communication Awards are accepted until February 9th. So, please, hurry up and turn your browsers on to this URL. And he gives it its www.keckfutures.org slash awards slash nominate. Uh, the nomination process is very straightforward and I promise it will not take more than a few minutes. Please choose online for the category of your nomination. I think the online entry title should be microbe TV and the online publishers are professional, uh, professor rack and yellow and his co-hosts for the online published date. It has to be due during 2017 just use January 1st, then write about a 100-word summary of what you think of TWIV and its sister podcasts. If you need detailed info, info, please check out the infographic accompanying this blog post. Um, it's uh, one of Vincent's, right? Virology.ws, 2017, 9, 6, 35 years later. Yep. Uh, then provide, and we can put these links in the show notes. Then provide web URLs of your favorite microbe TV podcasts. You have up to six URLs, so you could refer to your favorite blog posts um, on uh, the uh, virology.ws website or YouTube lectures uh, on the uh, U uh, Vincent's YouTube lectures. Finally, Professor Rack and Yellow's contact info, info can be found on his Columbia webpage. And he gives the link for that. And until Bill Gates catches the twib bug and helps <laughs> Professor Rack and Yellow build his team glass doored science podcasting studio on Main Street, <laughs> let us show the whole world that Twiv has a bunch of faithful listeners who will support their show all the way. Thanks very much for your time. Well, thank you, Islam. And 
Why not? Go for it. This will be uh, posted when? Uh, Sunday. On the 4th? Yep. So you got five days right away. Go for it. All right. Thank you, Islam. Snippet. Jolene writes, happy 2018 to all my favorite Twifsters. Actually, Kathy, could you read that? She, oh, did you go? Uh, she, sure. She's probably muted. There she is. <laughs> Happy 2018 to all my favorite Twisters. This paper, she gives a link, came to my attention late last year, and I thought it might be an interesting one for Twiv. In the paper, they explore a phenomenon where viral capsids are detected by the innate immune system. This was apparently not the first time it has been seen, but I hadn't heard of it before. With such conserved folds in virus capsid proteins, who would be surprised that the immune system might detect the array arrangement rather than the amino acids? To me, it was a bit reminiscent of how bacterial LPS is detected. And then she has a somewhat related pick of the week, and that's induction of antiviral immune response through recognition of the repeating subunit pattern of capsids is toll-like receptor 2 dependent. So there's two. two oh, those are, that is the that's paper. That's the paper, That's yeah. the same paper. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the pick, and then her wait, pick of the week, later. you moved to down below. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So, so thank you. So this is from Jolene and Kathy pasted a picture of Jolene and me in Indiana. And I University. can't get the Dolly Parton song out of my head now, by the way. Which one? <laughs> Jolene. Jolene. Yeah. Jolene. 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 <laughs> so Jolene, yeah. since you are a virologist with extremely good taste, yes. <laughs> as, as she wrote my favorite Twivsters, yeah, you must be able to spot a good paper. So we're, I thought it would be a good snippet. And bio. Uh, and Kathy um, said the title. It is from Montana State University and Indiana University. Kelly Shepardson, Benjamin Schwartz, Kyle Larson, Rachel Mar Morton, Avera McCoy, Caffrey Harmson, Douglas, and Rinda Apple. Interesting idea. So we've talked about innate immunity before and how, you know, it's an early response to infection. There are sensors in cells like toll-like receptors Cytoplasmic proteins like Rig I, MDA5, um, C-gas that detect RNA or DNA. But there are also some detectors of proteins. And not many people have worked on that very much. And that's what this paper is about. Can the protein the array of a capsid, which is a repeating array of proteins or a glycoproteins in an envelope virus, could they be recognized by innate immune receptors? So they have had a previous paper where they show if you, um, inf if you give mice a bacteriophage capsid, an icosahedral protein shell, <laughs> it will prime the innate system in such a way to um, reduce... Um, lethality to, uh, what is it, influenza virus challenge, I believe, is what their previous paper was. So that's so, weird, right? Because it's a phage priming innate immunity towards a virus. Yes. So uh, I have to jump in a little bit here. The Mephanicaldococcus right. Yanashi is an archaea. <laughs> and uh, you already kind of hesitated on the part that uh, bugged me about this, that they called it a capsid. And then I looked in mm. several dictionaries and online, and capsid is never referred to by how they define it, which they define kind of late in the paper as a, uh, where, where is it now? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, a multi-subunit protein assembly surrounding a hollow cargo volume. Mm. Uh, and that's what they're calling a capsid. So when they say capsid, they don't necessarily mean a viral capsid. They mean this protein assembly with high hollow shell. It's a more yeah. it's a more general definition of capsid. Yeah, that they have just made up. That they yes. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, I mean, but it would have been nice had they wanted to do that. That they would have defined it up front. We're going to call these things capsids because we can't think of a better word. And here's what they include. But they do say they have. I mean, some of these are virus capsids, right? Empty, yes. empty capsids, right? Some yes. are, but not, but not them, this yeah. heat shock protein from no, the archaea. <laughs> so the, the original paper, the previous paper, they used a, a phage P22 capsid um, mm -hmm. in these experiments, and I, I guess that's a bona fide capsid. Mm -hmm. 
right? Mm-hmm. But the sea chalk protein is not. And we'll hear more non not bona fide capsids today as well. Well, they want to try and extend this in this paper. So um, they take, the, the model is they have mice, which they will infect with Staph aureus. And they, they will then look at uh, bacterial replication and, and survival in these mice. And, and they will previously give the mice um, some capsids um, or influenza virus infection. So the influenza virus is an actual virus infection. And, and they will either do that and look at the effect on uh, bacterial recovery or they'll give them a capsid. So the bacterial infection is an assay to see if they've turned on innate yeah, immunity. That's right. And you could argue that, you know, it's one assay and maybe yeah. try some other things too, and I'm hoping that they'll do that in the future. Right, but the, the, the innate immune system, I mean, these pathogen-associated molecular patterns or PAMPs turn on the system, and we kind of have the idea that it's probably fairly yeah. generic, so one test should, should give you an answer. <clears throat> So they take mice, they inoculate them with either influenza virus or this phage P22 capsid, and then they challenge them at three, seven, or 14 days later with Staph aureus. Uh, and so they find that the mice inoculated with the capsid have a, uh, a similar increase in clearance of the bacterium uh, like influenza virus uh, inoculated mice. Um, in other words, better clearance than mice that only receive the bacteria. Um, and they also use a, a paramyxovirus pneumonia virus of mice, which is um, an envelope virus. So there, it's not a it's not a bona fide virus capsid, but it is an envelope virus with glycoproteins. They say they they get a similar enhancement of uh, of or a repression of bacterial replication, Staph aureus replication. So they've now extended the original discovery with some other capsids if you will. And they the next look at cytokine production, and they see that cytokines are increased by this pretreatment with um, capsids, which is something you would expect. Cytokine output is something you get when you stimulate innate immunity. They want to know what, what sensor is sensing these capsids. Um, so it happens with both influenza virus and phage P22, and they say, what's sensing it? So they do a series of nice experiments in, in genetically modified mice. So you can take mice lacking this adapter molecule called MyD88, and all of the toll-like receptors, nearly all the toll-like receptors depend on that. So you can knock them all out at once, and they find that in MyD88 null mice, this you don't see this effect of priming the innate system with these capsids. And eventually they narrow it down to uh, TLR2. So you, you have TLR2 knockout mice. They don't show this priming effect uh, of these capsids. So TLR2 signaling uh, right. is required. And they have an agonist of TNR, TLR2, which is uh, given to the mice before infection with Staph aureus. And this, um, you get better bacterial clearance as, as you would with treating the mice with the capsids, which would uh, bind to that receptor, presumably. So they think that these the TLR2 is, rec, is is recognizing structural patterns, right? So we have two different things, influenza A virus or this mouse paramyxovirus. They have like a proteins, but they are repeated over and over on the surface. And of course, the capsid of P22, icosahedral capsid with uh, proteins repeated over and over again. So they think somehow um, these are being recognized. So then they try what they call a library of capsids with various sizes and shapes, including tobacco mosaic virus, <laughs> which is a rod-shaped capsid. I'm laughing because we just went through tobacco mosaic virus in the virology course. Um, they also, here's probably what, what um, Kathy doesn't like, ferritin capsids. They call them ferritin capsids, right? Small twelve. Now, now what animal does ferritin infect? <laughs> mm, ferrets. Is it ferrets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ferritin, um, which is, the, I guess, it's a repeated thing with small size, right? Right. Um, urine ferritin capsids. So these all work to improve clearance of uh, Staph aureus, and it's all dependent on TLR2. 
ferritin protein caps is very small, so it's not just a size thing uh, that they that this is dependent on. If you break, and also if you break apart the p twenty two, the phage caps it into individual proteins. They don't work either. So you need a repeating protein structure. Yeah, you need a repeating right. protein structure. And next they say, what about non-capsids? So they try filamentous actin, right, which is a long repeating structure composed of actin, of course. Um, and they also, that also can um, stimulate bacterial clearance, although the, the details are slightly different. So something else is going on there as well. Uh, and the globular actin doesn't work. So the globular actin would just be monomers, basically, of actin. So once again, right? it's got to be a repeating structure. A repeated structure, right. Um, and um, that was mostly what I wanted to bring up. Um, there's a lot of detail in this, but the point here is that some kind of repeating structure, which is found on viral capsids, perhaps envelope viruses with glycoproteins and and um, multimeric proteins like filamentous actin can engage toll-like receptors, uh, turn on the innate immune response, and provide some kind of protection against um, a bacterial infection, which, as Alan said, is a readout. It doesn't mean that you need to right. be given a phage to prevent a bacterial infection. It's just a readout. And the, the key now is how are, is toll-like receptor 2 recognizing these patterns, right? Right. It'd be really interesting to know I'm, I mean, I had a lot of trouble imagining how, you know, on the one hand, a, an icosahedral phage, a spherical capsid, and a glycoprotein array on an envelope would both engage this, right? Because they're different. Well, yeah, and back when you were talking about the envelope viruses, they, they point out specifically that the um, the gl uh, glycoproteins on influenza uh, have are tightly distributed with an average spacing mm. of nine nanometers, leading to a similarly spaced polyvalent protein surface as the coat protein of the P22 capsid. So they they talk about how that could work for an envelope virus. So I wonder what the TLR2 is seeing, right? Something uh, space, know, something space, something space, right? Right. What's yeah. what's the pattern? Yeah. Yeah. It's and, and if you look up uh, if you look up what the other what other agonists there are for TLR two yeah they're all over the map okay yeah uh, LPS uh, lipo uh, lipopolysaccharide acid teotic acid opsa porin GPI now those are, anchor mm. those are other those are other PAMPs right yeah, uh, yeah. pathogen yes. associated patterns mm. yes and all bacterial right okay. That it, uh, as they say in the paper, there are four different viruses at least that can tweak TLR2, herpes simplex, varicella zoster, mm. cytomegalovirus, and measles. On measles, it's the hemagglutinin. And on the others, it's, uh, well, they don't know on varicella zoster. Well, it's varicella zoster and CMV is probably similar to herpes simplex, and that is the surface glycoproteins. Or maybe it's the capsid. I suppose they... Uh, Although, uh, yeah, right. There's a reference here to something that has actually apparently fingered the uh, specific glycoproteins with herpes. Okay. So, interestingly, as I started to read this, I started to think about how is this uh, related to the T independent antigen phenomenon, which is where things of repeating structure like lipopolysaccharide, but also viruses with icosahedral symmetry like a polyoma and mouse adenovirus, and we published on this, that there's two different kinds of T-independent antigens, TI1 and TI2. These seem to be the TI2 type, whereby you don't have to um, have a T cell to activate the, the B cells, and that there's this clustering effect because of the repeating structure. So to me, it was all reminiscent of that, phenomenon mm. in the adaptive immune side, but now something that's happening on the innate immune side. And they, they kind of briefly allude to that at the bottom of uh, page seven. This is open access, so people can look at that if they want. And they reference uh, papers 32 and 33. Um, but I, I didn't really see them referencing anything about T-independent antigens, which I thought would have been interesting to tie in. I, I 
wonder if you could someday have a structure of TLR2 bound to one of these capsids, yeah. you know. Yeah. If the affinity is high enough to do that, it would be interesting to see what's being recognized, right? Right. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. um, in the case of the B cell receptors, they are antigen specific, right, Kathy? So that's how they're binding to the repeated subunits. But here, there's no sequence specificity, right? Because all these right. capsids are of diverse sequences. So. Right. It's kind of, I mean, I found it intriguing, and mm-hmm. I hope that they continue to work on it so so that we can figure out what's being recognized. Mor- morning, Dixon, or good afternoon. I was, I was, I was hearing heavy breathing. <laughs> Dixon must have shown it. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to TWIV, this Thank week you. in virology. The kind that make you sick. This is episode 479. Yes. <laughs> How's the weather? Pleasure to be here. Never. It's a cold outside. It's actually cold. But it's not bad. It's tolerable. So why is this interesting? So we have, we just finished our snippet, Dixon. We have okay. toll-like receptor 2 recognizing patterns, repeated patterns on capsids and polymeric molecules like filamentous axon, glycoproteins, and virus particles. What is it recognizing? Uh-huh. And how can we use this? Why is this interesting? They say, from the perspective of vaccine design, determining the importance of toll-like receptor 2 recognition of viruses will be necessary to elucidate whether the response is dependent on allelic differences between people, I guess. I guess you could could imagine putting adjuvants in vaccines that might tap into this and um, give you a more robust immune response. Sure. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up, so this idea that the uh, influenza virus has these tightly spaced glycoproteins, which give the repeated array that may be necessary for this sensing, HIV has really sparse glycoproteins in its envelope. So I wonder if this would not, if that virus would not um, hmm. have this effect, right? I would predict no. It'd be very one, interesting One to would. One would predict. But I, I mentioned it to Steve Goff this morning. He said, yeah, but those glycoproteins can move around in the envelope. So maybe... Uh-huh. They could move around and engage. They being float on the lipid by bilayers. The floaters, yeah. <laughs> you know, the floaters in your eye. Right. So that's interesting. I think it's a kind of a provocative paper. Um, yeah. it's from And some of the authors are from Indiana University. And uh, Kathy, when we were there, we, we didn't hear anything about this, did we? <laughs> no one came up to us. On. No, no one no. came up and said, we have this cool paper. <laughs> no. on capsids coming out. And this came out in November, December. Well, maybe, yeah, it would have been the right time, too. Indiana University is kind of capsid central, right? Sure, yeah. big, big time. That's yeah. where I learned how to make buckyball capsids. There you go. My, my desk is covered with them. Now, look. Oh, you can't see, but Dixon can see. I can see them. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and there was just this review in viruses that came out from the IU group about how geometric defects in icosahedral viruses are something that you miss when you average structures, mm. but that uh, in some cases, the, these things that we might think of as errors are actually something that's intentional or important. Uh, and uh, so that was an interesting thing that we also mm. didn't really touch on while we were there. So I a lot of cool that. structural stuff there. I talked to a um, professor in the chemistry department during that visit, and she's the one who taught me how to make Bucky ball capsids, and um, he's interested in nanoparticles and capsids and so forth, but he's not on this paper. You- I knew the chemist who invented Buckminster Fullerene. You did? He won a Nobel Prize. What's the name? Uh, it begins with K, and he ended up at uh, Florida State University, Um he was from England originally. And, uh, oh, I met him. He's a fantastic guy. He's passed away, yeah. unfortunately. And a uh, very interesting guy. Vincent, you should make a, a YouTube video of how to make these what it, Bucky, Bucky, ball Bucky, viruses. Ball. Bucky, Bucky ball viruses. So yeah. It's funny you should ask that. I actually recorded one over, <laughs> over the holidays. It was like the oh. Christmas Eve. I was here and nobody was around. So I oh. shut the door, put the lights on, and I recorded... I recorded it, and I, you know, I'm using my hands to assemble these things. It was really hard to get the right angle because <laughs> every time I would watch the monitor, you know how when you watch yourself do things in a mirror, you totally get screwed up. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then 
my hands were really dry, so it looks horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering if I could somehow retouch my fingers because they're all dry and cracked. And so I'm gonna. I haven't yet released it yet, but uh, yeah. And I want to do it with no no voiceover, just a little bit of text and music. And I thought that would be pretty cool. Yeah. Hmm. Get Ray to help you on that. Ray or Tate. Maybe Ray. Yeah, maybe yeah. he can help you retouch your hands too. <laughs> Neutrogena. Isn't that silly? Is, Neutrogena. Isn't that silly that I'm worried about my dry hands? But well. just driving in this morning, I'm thinking, oh, I don't know if I can release that. It was all <laughs> it was really cold back then. But now, Dixon, now that you're here, I wanted to tell you this very brief story. I had a dream this morning, Uh-oh. and I was in, driving, and it was a big snowstorm, and I got stuck, and there were cars in front and behind in a little some town somewhere and i got out to look for a shovel and the minute i came back and they my car was stolen and i stood in the middle of the road and i had my backpack in it and i screamed oh no my videos because you're for many months i used to carry hard drives with the parasitic diseases videos that we shot in my backpack right, right. and it was the only copy i had of those for a long time because i would carry them and try and work on them wherever i was now, the thing is, about two months ago, I copied them all to a hard disk at home, but my right. dream didn't realize that. Why? <laughs> well, you're asking no, me. Yeah, but your dream cared about your videos and not your car. <laughs> right. I didn't even care about my car. I was like, the right. video was the first thing, Dixon. And, I'm, and my first thought was, oh my gosh, I have to have Dixon and Daniel record those again. They're never going to want to do it. But it's right. okay. I woke up and I said, no, that's not real. <laughs> do you know when you wake up and it's... A, you realize that you're okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't right. that the greatest feeling? It's like a Charles Dickens. I wanted story. to tell you that. That's why I waited for you to come back. <laughs> Thank you. The other paper um, is an interesting one that I picked because of you, Dixon. Really? Because I thought you would like mosquitoes. I love mosquitoes. <laughs> I used to work with them in the lab. Published in eLife, <clears throat> an 80s Egypti associated fungus increases susceptibility to dengue virus by modulating gut trypsin. Activity. That's amazing, isn't it? Johns Hopkins, Bloomberg School of Public Health. Right. Yesenia Angelero, Anglero Rodriguez, Octavio Taluli, Bloomberg, Kang, Demby, Shields, Carlson, Jupatana Cool, and George Dimapoulos. It made me wonder whether Bloomberg was a relative of the Baruch Bloomberg. Baruch Bloomberg. There are yeah. lots of Bloombergs. There are. But not too many in science. So this caught my eye, not only because I know you like mosquitoes. I love them. I love them. It has a fungus in it. It does. We don't talk about fungi much on TWIV, nope. right? And dengue virus, of course. Right. Which uh, we talk about often. Yes. So, uh, Dick Dixon, this is really That's... cool because, the, <clears throat> and I like the microbiome. Yes. Exactly. So, That's not a mispronounced microbiome. <laughs> no, no, no. I love that. Microbiome. We have microbiome, we have virome, we have microbiome. What else? We, if you have a protozoal biome. <laughs> well, we do. Protobiome. We do, we do, we do. We do. <laughs> I love those words. Yep. So the, the mosquito mid-gut. First of all, Dixon, what is a mid-gut? Is there a foregut and an after-gut? There is. Okay. What happens in the hind mid-gut? gut? It's not hind an after gut. gut. It's okay, a- like an afterburner. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, an afterbirth. No, so what's no, no, a no. what's a mid gut? A mid gut is the, the the business end of the digestive tract for the nah. mosquito. So a mosquito acquires a blood meal. Yes, goes to the mid gut. Yes, through the foregut. Right, that's correct. And there it's digested. That's right. right? Usually, right. And then the mosquito uses uh, the digestion enzymes to make eggs. Right. Mm. If it's a female. Well, uh, well it uses a, the nutrients. There's the a nutrients. couple of steps missing. And, and the, yeah, the, the mid gut of the uh, mosquitoes is it got long, hollow projections that go off the back called diverticula. Mm-hmm. And the the red cells get packed into those diverticulae. So, so mos- mosquitoes have diverticulitis? No. <laughs> they don't get diseases from that. They actually like that because it really allows them to plasma freeze. Mm-hmm. And they can pack in a lot of red cells into those diverticula and let the serum portion go through. Actually, one of the things in this paper, they, they, weigh, they weigh the mosquitoes, they get heavier. <laughs> <laughs> they get a lot heavier. This is true. In fact, there's a, there's a control strategy based on that because they all fly very slowly and very short distances after they feed. They, they so, land almost immediately after feeding. They do. Yeah. And, and if you have open windows where they came through and you've sprayed that with DDT, 
they can then land on that and get killed. So uh-huh. that is a, is a very effective strategy for controlling uh-huh. mosquitoes. So this says places. here that um, some there's a microbiome and a microbiome in the mosquito gut. And some of these bacteria can inhibit viral infection. I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know yeah. that either. So there are fungi in there as well, and that's what this paper is about too. See what's the role of the fungus now? When exactly. so w- this is one thing I actually never thought about. But when the, when a mosquito takes a blood meal and there are viruses in the blood, they go into the mid gut. Yes, it's amazing that they actually survive, right? Well, so there, so there are lots of enzymes in there. Maybe a lot of them don't, based on this. So one. our our stomach is acidic. For example, is this mid gut acidic at all? Do you know? It's. That's a good. The answer is yes. It is. I know it is true because the there's a control for insects in general based on uh, using uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, mm. and Bacillus thuringiensis creates a protein which crystallizes under acid conditions. So when the bacteria is ingested by insects, almost all insects have um, uh, acidic uh, gut tracts. Mm. The proteins are released from the digested Bacillus thuringiensis, and then it crystallizes, and it actually blocks the digestive tract of the mus- of the insect. And that's the mechanism by which it kills them. So it's interesting that viruses can survive the mid gut, isn't it? That's right. Would you Would you like to bet though as to what happened in Israel when they applied BT to all their crops to try to prevent insects from invading them? What happened? BT resistance. And think of how that might have occurred. That's true. BT resistance is exactly right. BT goes in the insect gut, right? Yeah. Remember, it it needs an acidic environment in order to crystallize. Uh, Less acidic guts? Got it. It, 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 Selected for insects. Selected for insects that were mutants that had a less acidic gut tract. Cool. That's very cool. And the protein didn't form, and they kept eating those tomato plants. They actually engineered the protein into the tomato plant. Yeah, that's that is actually the basis for yeah, um, yeah, yeah. for insecticidal crops generally. That's right. So all the all the biotech crops that require less sprayed insecticide right. are doing that because they're producing BT toxin proteins and Bacillus thuringiensis toxin is the primary pesticide used in organic agriculture. Bingo. So to follow up on a statement Rich Condit made, he said a few weeks ago, "I'll eat." DNA of any sequence. Would you, That's also, right. would you also eat BT? Sure, why not? Hey, go for it, big guy. Someone picked I'm, that up, by the way, on Twitter, and he tweeted just that. Rich Condit says, I'll eat DNA of any sequence. I thought that was really funny. As long as it's not in a capsid. Exactly. That's right. That's it's right. Like, <laughs> so in this study, they want to know what's the role of the mycobiome in, in virus infection. So they pick dengue, right. and they collect female 80s. Uh, mosquitoes from uh, southeastern Puerto Rico, where dengue is endemic. Yep, and they maybe not anymore. <laughs> they um, oh, it certainly is still. They yeah. dis- they sect out their midguts and they plate them on agar for fungal growth, and they identified a species Tolleromyces. Right, and um, they sequenced it and showed that it was Tolleromyces. It's an ascomycete. Is it? It is. And it's, it's related, related to, to penicillium species? Correct. Okay. And um, then they fed mosquitoes a, a, solu- a, sh- a spore, a fungal spore-laced sugar solution. Yeah. Lovely. <laughs> Sounds like a good drink. Yum. <laughs> and then they said, what's going on in there? They take the whole mosquito in the mid-gut, and they say, are there any fungal colony-forming units, CFUs? Right. And they show that after you feed mosquitoes these fungal spores, you can see the fungus in the um, whole mosquito and in the midguts. So it will grow in them. It must have a receptor then, no? But the fungus? Yeah. Oh, it just goes in the gut and grows. It, that, that's not how they depicted it in their figures. Yeah, it was hooked onto a cell, right? Right. I don't know. It's a good question. Anyway, it doesn't hurt the mosquitoes to have this. Apparently Which not. makes sense because you got it from them, right, to begin with. Well. So the other day I ate a little bit of moldy bread and I lay awake at night worrying that I was going to get sick. No, maybe it was penicillium. <laughs> you were actually affecting your because, microbiome. You know, it could pass through your gut and start to multiply. And, and the question is why I ate it, of course, but it's another story. Um, so then they- You eat moldy stuff all the time. You like blue cheese? I love exactly. blue cheese. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, Brie? Yeah, but on. would you eat a moldy bagel? No. Uh, no, not deliberately. No, no. I did. I saw it, and I said, eh, "I'm eating this." <laughs> I was I just. It? I just cut it off. It's fine. It was white. Stale. It, it was white. Yeah, it was pretty old. But I'm a 
cheapskate. I didn't want to throw it away because <laughs> I'm the only one who will eat it. Well, so then they have these. Sorry, what were you going to say? No, I was just going to say if you inhale the spores of that, there are people that get aspergillosis. Yeah, of that. course. So that's well, we're always inhaling spores on a we daily are. basis, but some people, if you're that's immunosuppressed, right. that's can exactly be a big right. problem. Exactly. So they ask, all right. So if you infect these mosquitoes now that we've given this fungus with dengue, what happens? Uh huh. And I and Kathy, do you like that they enumerated the dengue virus titers? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think they look for at a least different, they did. They did plaque assays, so uh-huh. they, right? they they were looking for a different word than we determine the titers. You know, right? People, sometimes yeah. when you write a right, paper, right. you try and find different words. Right. So it turns out yeah, that some of the copy editing in this could use a little more work. <laughs> I think. Uh, yeah. yeah, there there were some straight um, hmm. commas and such. Yeah. Um, so having this fungus. Increases dengue replication, increases it. The fungus allows the mosquitoes to make more dengue, which is interesting, right? Exactly. It's not much. It's significant. You're yeah, right. it's statistically rich, significant, you're right. but it's you're not right. much. It's borderline significance. I would well, yeah, there's no, a, it's three stars <laughs> significance, yeah. but it's, 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 it's not much. It's, it's not a big stuff. number. It's not remarkable. Okay, it is a log scale here. They're going from yeah, it's three to maybe. Uh, 3.2 logs, you know, that's not tenfold. It's what, twofold, something like that. Well, what are you looking at? What figure two? Fourfold. I'm looking at figure two. Yeah. D and E. Yeah. I, must say, yeah. I, uh, I was looking at the, I was looking at the Orlando on the right. Yeah. It's a small effect. Because <laughs> you're originally from Florida. right? <laughs> <laughs> so they, they not only measure the, uh, a, a abundance of the virus in the mid gut. They also quantitate the number of mosquitoes that have the bug in it. And they do that by staining with mercurochrome. Mm. They digested the mid guts and stained them with mercurochrome and then counted those. So those are those little inset prevalence graphs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Does yeah. trypsin actually render dengue virus uninfective? Oh, you're way ahead of us. Yeah. Can you, wait? can you wait? Slow we knew about this Where'd the person come from? <laughs> can we wait? <laughs> We're still on the fungus. Okay, okay, okay. That, I mean. Hey, I just got in here, okay? <laughs> no, but we started the paper. As yeah, I know that, that. I know that. But it's all right. You know, one of my students yesterday who came for office hours. Yes. Because we have a test next week. You do. Dixon, we were all talking, and Dixon said, can I close the door? And I said, sure. And he closed the door. And one of them said, be nice to Dixon. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I was. I let him tell me that last night. <laughs> People like you. And were you? <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, you can close the door even if no, you No, no. Were you nice to Dixon? <laughs> well, I wasn't really because you said, can I close the door to have a phone call? And I said, even if it's a, an inane phone call, sure. <laughs> right. Or useless phone call. No, was, Sorry. So, um, so now they want to know what is happening. What are the What's the fungus doing? So. Exactly. You know, the standard way would be, is it secreting something that is do it, having this effect? And that's an easy way. That's an easy path to take. I guess. Yes, that's right. So a secreted factor. So they uh, make a suspension. I like this one. I like this So one. they grow up the fungus and they take the, the, the supernatant, I suppose, right? Yeah. Which contains the secretome. They filter it, of course, to get the, out the mycelia and the spores. Uh, and then they feed this to mosquitoes. Right. This is the micro, mycosecretome. That's right. <laughs> the mycosecretome. If we're going to go full omics on this. <laughs> and, we can, and you can have a drink it's some, in a bar called the mycosecretome. That's you think right. anyone would buy it? <laughs> and then they have a separate sure. prep where they heat it. Where you, I think most drinks you get in a bar have microsecretome as part of the <laughs> That's ingredients. right. Inadvertent. <clears throat> and um, indeed, the, if you feed mosquitoes... If you feed a moose a cookie, <laughs> if you feed mosquitoes a secretome, it will increase dengue replication, uh, whereas the heat-treated solution will not. Exactly. Now, when you do this heat- is, This is an old-time biochemistry Classic trick. biochemistry. It is. It yeah. is. It's like back to plaque typically, assays. <laughs> typically, that implies that it's protein, because the protein yeah. will and, denature and in the But they heat. did one more thing, too, though, that was very clever, and that is they use a related fungus. Yeah, penicillium chrysogenum. Also isolated from field caught exactly. mosquitoes and um, did not affect did not affect mm-hmm. either it, the fungus but it or did the affect filter. something else. But we'll get to that later. Well, it's in the same paragraph. That's what true. did it affect? The plasmodium. 
What's plasma? It's a eukaryotic something. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and then they have Anopheles. Just a little fever. You're okay. Anopheles gambiae. It's a different That's mosquito. Right. Totally different mosquito. So they um, have previously shown that this chrysogenum will enhance plasmodium infection That's right. in a different mosquito. You think it's the same mechanism? No. Oh, okay. That's very because, interesting. Because the gametes of malaria have to be digested away from their red cells first in order to mate. So you can't inhibit trypsin. You can't do that and, and get this to work. Interesting. In the gut? Yeah. Hmm. That's right, because the malaria goes through a separate set of life cycle stages in the mosquito, right? Correct. Yeah. In fact, Whereas the mosquito is the de definitive host. Right. Whereas dengue virus is just going to replicate That's and right. get to the... Exactly. Um, Who is the definitive the host for dengue virus? I don't think it's definable because it's not a <laughs> sexual organism. <laughs> is that what you, definitive means? Yeah. Is where the sexual stages occur? That's correct. Interesting. So you're saying, Dixon, yeah. viruses do not have sex. Uh, no, but they couldn't interfere with it. <laughs> I have a headache. <laughs> they can't exchange <laughs> sort of genetic information, though. They can. Okay. They can. So It's th sex, but not as we know it, Captain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Captain? <laughs> That's great. Dear, dear. We should rename this episode. <laughs> now, so um, they, they, what did they do here? TSP, this is this fungus, um, they show that it will also increase parasite oocyst numbers in the gut of this other mosquito. Right. What does that mean, Dixon? Parasite oocyst numbers. It means that they increased the success rate of the parasite. Oocysts are what happens after the gametes mate and form the zygote. And then they migrate through the wall yeah. of the gut of the mosquito underneath the membrane that holds the cells together, mm -hmm. and they develop back into haploid or organisms and begin to produce sporocysts. Okay. Sporozoites, rather. So that numbers of those oocysts they go up. increased by this fungus. Yeah, but it didn't say it did it by inhibiting trypsin, though, right? No, no. Exactly. Just No, they just let that go once they got They there. did, but they should have really talked about that because it would have been... Uh, it's another paper. Another paper, You yeah. think? <laughs> hmm. Yeah, because, uh, you know, from these guys, from their history, it looks like they're interested in, in the mosquitoes. They're, yeah, they're, that's they're right. not... They're, I mean, it's not, they aren't interested in dengue, but they're mostly interested in the mosquitoes. Right. It, it seems like the strength of their lab is the mosquitoes. Yes. Yeah. I would agree. The, the next series of experiments are to ask whether this, um, this secretome of the fungus is, actually inhibits bacteria in the gut, which would then inhibit, which would then uh, stimulate viral replication. But Perhaps. the secretome does not appear to inhibit. Um, bacterial oh. growth. Well, I would love to see what happens in an Aedes aegypti mosquito that has Wolbachia. I wonder what happens in How that do you know situation. That, uh, these are wild caught, so they probably yeah, don't have right. Wolbachia. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. But I wanted to say Serratia marcescens. <laughs> Kathy, do you say Serratia? Yep. Good. Think. <laughs> How else do people say it? Serratia. No, oh, no, no. People come, Sorry. no, you, that's not serratia, that's serratia. I said, no, that's not how I was Serratia is what you put on hot, that's a hot stuff, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, almost. <laughs> that's right. All right, so that's the, the, no effect on bacteria. So what does it do? So they then, so here, this is an interesting point. Now, now you want to know what the uh, secretome is doing. Yes. So in the old days, you were kind of stuck, but nowadays you do a transcription. Proteomics, that's right. <laughs> transcriptome. Yeah. You say- you give mosquitoes uh, secretome, and then with and without secretome, you, you pull out their RNA, and you see what RNAs they're making, right? And gosh, if, what would we do 50, 20 years ago? That would be really hard. I can tell you what you did. You lost your grant because you couldn't do the experiments. <laughs> <laughs> so this analysis of the secretome, they find upregulated and downregulated a variety of genes, but the ones that are really interesting, 22% of the total downregulated genes encode trypsins. That's incredible. There are three different kinds, they said, right? Yeah, different trypsins. And so the, the implication is that this, this fungal secretome is inhibiting uh, trypsin right. gene mRNA transcription, and that would be impairing the ability to digest the blood meal, right? Exactly. So trypsins contribute to this. Uh, do do Hemozoan, Dixon. What about it? Hemozoan, that, that occurs in the mammalian host. 
We're not worried about hemozone here. No. What I'm worried about here, though, is that whether there's actually limited egg production in the 80s of Gypti because it limited the amount of protein they can digest. Mm-hmm. So you, you could use this. There. Sorry? Yeah, we'll get We're there. getting there. We'll get oh, there. okay, okay, okay. I just raised it as a uh, hypothetical question. <laughs> they, they have an assay now. They want to know what's the effect so, of this trypsin inhibition, right? Right. And as you said, ovary development. Yeah. Is one output. So they they said, do, does this fungal secreto-mediated inhibition of trypsin gene transcription affect ovary development? Mm-hmm. So they give mosquitoes secretome or not, and then they they look at their uh, ovaries and ask, okay. um, can you see a decrease in yep. ovary development? The vitiline cells. Is that easy to do? Yeah, very easy to do. It's extremely it's small, easy. no? No, but they're big enough to see under a microscope. Big nice. Microscope. Yeah. <laughs> the vitiline cells are quite visible. So if you feed them a fungus secretome, they have a de- decreased ovary development. Right. And what you just said, Yeah. you asked the question, so inhibiting the trypsin has an effect on that. It because does. Because the products of digestion are used to, to produce right. eggs. Precisely. Right? Wow. That's pretty so cool. So this fungus produces something that inhibits mosquito digestion and that seems to affect the mosquito's ability to potentially reproduce. Right. Why is this fungus there to begin with? Correct. I can't say why, right? <laughs> you can't say why. Well, yeah, but you can ask what's, uh, I mean, maybe what's in it for the mosquito? Probably yeah. not much, but what's in it for the fungus? Uh, this appears to be a host. So would yeah. you say this is a parasitic fungus? It's looking like it. It's taking something from the mosquito, right? Of course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Of course. What's Fungi. the reason that the secretome inhibits trypsin? To, pr- to allow the fungus to grow, you think? That's right. Maybe it's protecting Probably. itself. Yeah. 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 They didn't actually look at that in this paper, right? No. Whether the no. fungal growth is enhanced or in the, in the absence of trypsin. I guess they could make a fungus lacking this right. inhibitor. Yeah. You'd have to, I don't know what kind of genetic engineering yeah. capabilities they have for this particular fungus. But ideally, yeah, you'd make you a strain of the that, fungus yeah. that yeah. lacks the the gene requ- the, or the genes required for this, and then put it in the mosquito and see what you get. Of course, we don't even know what those genes are at this point. So that's, yeah, that's presume, yeah, that's a whole different grant. That's right. And then in, in here, <laughs> in this in this paper in this experiment, m- mosquitoes who are treated with the secretome are heavier than non treated mosquitoes because you can't digest the blood. They say right. Exactly right. It's very interesting. It. I look at this fungus as kind of a. You know, the stuff you take for antacid, right? <laughs> <laughs> like Tums. <laughs> Tums or something. Although we're not, acid so, is not involved. I wonder how common it. it is to have Aedes aegypti mosquitoes in nature be infected with this fungus because they actually did all this stuff in the lab, Well, they right? caught these in the field and isolated it in those mosquitoes that were, in the, that were flying yeah. around in the field. But they didn't say how many out of the yeah. ones they caught no. and how common no, it is, No, right? we don't know what the denominator is. Right. That's a good question. So you're thinking about this as a biological control? Remember, Aedes aegypti as a tree hole breeder would be very difficult to get this to where the mosquitoes Well, you mean you have to get rid of the fungus. Oh, yeah. No, if this, no, th- no this if you is, want to use it as a control maker, measure. No. For what? Control what? For dengue. For the mosquito. mosquito. Well, dengue. And you get dengue. both for the price of one. So you got to remove the fungus to, to inhibit dengue replication, right? Because the mm. fungus in, increases dengue replication. So you have to because it rid- inhibits trypsin. That's yes. right. That's so you have right. to get rid of the fungus. Yeah, that's true. That's and true. then would that make it a poor host for dengue virus? Right. It's a trade-off though because you also get fewer Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Alan right. would say, just get rid of the mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, I mean the problem is this fungus appears to be hurting the mosquitoes. So if you keep, right, but but helping the dengue. Right. Um. So if you get rid of the fungus, you now the mosquitoes are less good at hosting dengue but they're healthier mm-hmm. so you potentially have more mosquitoes well right. got, i don't think they're not I just a host for dengue right yeah, but you've got a mosquito that can't reproduce basically uh yeah you've got a mosquito if you get rid of the fungus then the mosquito is going to reproduce better right the fungus is inhibiting its reproduction That's but right. The observation from the field is that there are wild mosquitoes with this fungus in them. Right. So we know a couple of things about it. First of all, the fungus is not killing off the mosquitoes. They're able to reproduce. And second, dengue is endemic to this area. So, you know, it's uh, it may or may not be responsible for that. 
but if you eliminated the, if you could eliminate the fungus, I don't know if you'd have an effect on the dengue incidence because you'd probably help the mosquitoes. Right. So it's a, it's a complex interaction going on there that I I don't think just based on what we know so far that this would be a winning game to try to mm. to try to you go in to, with. You have to take a whole section of jungle plus and minus <laughs> fungus <laughs> yes. and do a, and grind the whole thing up and do a yeah, black yeah. assay Lord. after some time. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds very destructive. Yes. <laughs> a couple of other experiments they do, they show that this secretome can inhibit the trypsin activity in the mosquito gut, and also of trypsin you could buy from Sigma, right? Right, right. Or wherever they bought it, it inhibits the enzyme. Right. And so it's acting two different ways. It's acting on gene expression, apparently, right. yep. and acting also directly on the enzyme activity. It's interesting, isn't it? Very. Mm-hmm. So. This is a secretome. They didn't have to start fractionating it. Yep. Do people still do fractionation and finding things that are active? Of course. I guess you sure. could. Yeah, of course. I think we've done papers that, that do that. Yeah. And they also knock down the trypsin <clears throat> genes in the mosquito. Right. To see if without the fungus, but right. with the knockdown trypsin, it still works. And that has the same effect. It stimulates. As well replicate. it should. So that means that. They have to, they have to silence um, all, all of them. Right. Because there's, there's a bunch. There's a bunch of them. And one of them is pretty good on its own, one of the genes. But when they silence all of them, you get the biggest mm-hmm. effect. So you inhibit trypsin uh, production, trypsin activity. You stimulate den- dengue replication. And what I would like to have seen is. A very simple in vitro experiment where you add trips into dengue virus. Yeah, me too. That's, you that's mentioned that earlier, before. right? That's what yeah. I asked before. They didn't do that. Right. Th- that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah. Because what if you saw zero effect on dengue infectivity? I mean, the capsid sounds like it should be susceptible to trips. Well, it's, right? it's got like it's got fl- glycoproteins lying on the membrane, right, flying flat. So you yeah. should be they should be cut off. Um, but if not, then it would imply that trypsin is acting on something else. Sounds like an easy experiment. Maybe it's been done already. I'm, Probably. Yeah, I'm on PubMed right now looking for it. Yep. Uh, I mean, even I could have done that experiment. <laughs> I might not have been able <laughs> to do you, the plaque assay. I was going to say, the plaque <laughs> assay. We could do that. I would have come you. to you. I would have come to you. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not immediately getting it, but that doesn't mean it hasn't been done. Right. Well, let's do it then. If they haven't done it, let's yeah, do it. Yeah, run, run to the lab, get some uh, dengue and some trypsin. <laughs> or anybody out there listening that would like an easy paper on yeah, If you're one. in a dengue lab, grab the trypsin out of the yeah, freezer. Yeah, exactly right. I can't now, they, they talk about the plasmodium mm. effect by that other fungus. Yeah, penicillin. And they said that there, it's, it's upregulation of an ornithine decarboxylase yeah, gene, yeah, yeah, which yeah. suppresses nitric oxide-dependent parasite exactly. killing. That's Very cool. I like that. I like that. But nitric, but this ornithine doesn't have an effect on uh, dengue, apparently. No. Exposure of aegypti to chrysogenum did not affect permissiveness to dengue. No. Well, dengue is an intracellular parasite, obviously, and, and the malaria parasites are extracellular mm. in the mosquito. So, so this, that's this, why they're susceptible to killing yeah, with nitric yeah. oxide. Then. This is probably a widespread phenomenon, fungi and various parasites, right? Yeah, and I'm, it's probably beyond mosquitoes too, right? Yes, sure. Well, I would yeah. S- if any any anything surviving in the environment has to have a strategy for dealing with fungi, or is it going to interact with fungi at some point? So we have a microbiome. We do for sure. We know that our microbiome actually facilitates like polio replication, right? And I wonder if the microbiome facilitates some enteric viruses in some way. We don't Good. have these higher forms of fungi growing in our gut tract, though. No? No. What this is we... called a perfect fungus, by the way, because it has <laughs> the sexual stages. The imperfect stages are yeah. like uh, Canada. Mm-hmm. All right. So they, they actually have perfect stages, too, but they, they, they aren't found very frequently in nature. So we have, you know, um, yeasts growing in our gut tract, but we don't have higher fungi growing So these mycelial gut. forms, you, you mean? don't have that. That's well, bad. You'd die if from that. You'd, you would I mean, die, yes. Yeah, you would. That's not right. good. You right. would. So people with advanced age, they get these mycelial forms growing in them. You have something to look forward to? <laughs> did I say advanced age? You did. <laughs> AIDS, AIDS, not oh, AIDS. Oh, I thought you said <laughs> AIDS. <laughs> no, no, no. 
<laughs> Be nice to Dixon. <laughs> hey, uh, you know, that's right. Do you like this picture they have? This like is an it. open access journal, so you can see this picture. It's the model of their, of right. this, of this whole thing. So they have a little mycelial yeah, fungus like growing. It. Like it's secreting little spheres, blue spheres, which we don't know. We only know they're. Wait, those, no. those are ascospores. I'm sorry. No, 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 none of this is little. This is the hugest model diagram. <laughs> it's I've very big. Seen. Enormous. It's a whole page, yeah. <laughs> that's yes. right. That's right. It didn't need to be a whole page, did oh, it? Well, but it's free. See, so. but, and it's an online journal, so I guess they that's have right. page space. Exactly. So they have a secretome, which is heat labile. We know, so it's probably a protein, right? Those little spheres are ascospores. Um, this secretome. Yes. Is, there's an arrow from the secretome to dengue virus, and so I don't know what that arrow means, right? Because the, the secretome is working, right. inhibiting trypsin. So I don't know. What we they, don't actually. I don't think they've shown any connection dengue. between the between the secretome and dengue directly, yeah. have they? No, no, not that I know of. So the arrow there is kind of. Or, yeah, I guess they're they're maybe it saying works against dengue. The observation is that the presence of this secretome. Yeah. Um, improves dengue virus replication. Right. So, so that's why it's an arrow right. indicating a positive regulation. Mm. But the steps involved are the arrow, the um, lines going off to the side, inhibiting yeah. trypsin. Yeah. So one last thing is interesting in the discussion. They say, so this is a good question. A greater susceptibility of mosquitoes to dengue as a result of, of this fungus could translate into enhanced transmission, right? But that has to be, checked experimentally. It could, yeah. And then they say um, exposure of mis- the impact of this fungus on egg development and delayed degradation of blood suggests that exposing mosquitoes to the amounts of secretome that they used in this study would probably impose a fitness cost on mosquitoes. So it'd be hard to do the transmission experiment. Which, well, is yeah. another, which is another important point. We don't know if the natural levels of these proteins in the mosquito in the field that's got this fungus growing in it are as high as the doses that they delivered in the study. Yep. Right. Exactly. So it's, it may not be imposing much of a fitness cost on the mosquitoes. I seem to recall back in the, my mosquito days that the mosquitoes that are driven to bite a second time, and that's what you're dealing with here, right? Right. They've already bit, they've bitten once, but they've got a secretome coming out of a fungus that prevents them from digesting mm-hmm. their red blood cells, and therefore right. they're still laden with blood cells. Why would they bite again? I don't know. You tell me. They wouldn't. They're not stimulated to bite because they're diverticular and not empty. So but even though they're, you're saying that yeah. even though they've now got more <laughs> dengue in them, they're not going to take it anywhere correct because they're not going to bite again that is exactly so the right. dengue that's transmitted has to go to the salivary gland and multiply there right yeah but then it has to bite somebody right yeah so that happens later so why would they bite somebody when they they already feel as though they've got enough to make eggs so how long is it that's mis- not going to stay there forever right well, mosquitoes right. only live two weeks that's yeah but, but over over some period of time um i would assume that they're going to poop out whatever's there whether they fully digested it or not they don't poop it out. It's in their diverticula. Hmm. How many meals, blood meals, does a mosquito take in its lifetime? Usually one, but sometimes two. So that's where the transmission of viruses and, and malaria come in. Right? The ones who feed twice. Unless they're vertically transmitted in the mosquito, like West Nile, for instance. Yeah. Dengue is not vertically transmitted, Do we know as, far as I recall. we what fraction of mosquitoes feed twice as opposed to once? Less than 1%. Well, how the hell are these viruses transmitted? Exactly. There's right. a lot of mosquitoes. <laughs> mosquitoes. Yeah, no, no, this yes. is true. There's, there's, in the average, in the tropics during the summer months, and they're, they're just only summer months, right? But the, during the wet season, a kid is bitten at least a thousand times a day by mm. mosquitoes. A thousand the times think. a day. Okay. So eventually they'll all get it, right? Yeah, 1% of a thousand, you know. Every day. Yeah. Right. So it's all based on a second biting up. Yes, it is. If you could prevent mosquitoes from biting twice and they don't have to bite twice, they can just bite once. That's fine. You've reproduced. Everything is good. Yeah, you wouldn't get What's the selective pressure for biting twice? I don't even understand that. It's not fine with me when they bite once. (laughs) You don't like being bitten. I don't don't like that. It's true only for the mosquitoes not carrying vertically transmitted diseases. That's right. So West Nile is vertically? It is. What other viruses? Uh, let's see. I think encephalitis viruses. Also. Right. So if it's vertically transmitted, the mosquito can be born carrying. Correct. At mm-hmm. which point it only needs to bite once to that's transmit right. it. That's right. But dengue is not vertically transmitted. No, as far as we know, it is. So those have to bite twice. Exactly. And malaria too. Hmm. 
Yeah. Malaria always twice, never well, two once. Two weeks. I mean, you take a blood meal, you I know. you make eggs, and that's it. You die. Right. You lay them, exactly. and you die. Right? Exactly right. So only less than 1% of the mosquitoes actually bite twice. So maybe there's a gene for that. A, a I would physician. love to know that. And then, uh, what, Tony what, James, what, are you listening? What could you do? Does Wolbachia impact whether you bite don't once know. or twice? I don't know that answer. It's an interesting problem. I thought you would like this paper. I love this paper. Did everyone yeah. else like it? I think yeah. it's cool. I did. I yeah. thought it was neat. And we don't talk about fungi much. Maybe we need we to talk about fungal viruses. I actually have a fungal virus paper. Really? So many papers, so little time. I tell you. Right? And <laughs> Kathy, do you, do you have anything else here? I do. You could tell. Um, <laughs> I have to correct myself. Uh-oh. Uh, the uh, mercurochrome staining was actually enumerating the uh, uh, falciparum okay. oocysts. Right. So they don't really describe how they calculated their prevalence numbers. So mm. Those oocysts are pretty big. Okay. You could actually see them without even doing that if you wanted to. Right. So figure one, panel C, it's a lovely photograph of a mycelium, which they call a brush-like biverticillated conidiophore. Conidiophore. Now, why do you know so much about fungi? I've had a wonderful... I was telling uh, Amy, uh, one of our colleagues here, uh, about the wonderful time I had here as a student taking a course in medical medical mycology given by Uh Margarita Silva Hutner. And her colleague... um, was the one who discovered Grisio Fulvin, mm-hmm. who then was invited to Florence during that big flood back in the 60s. And she actually sprayed Grisio Fulvin over all the great works of art in the museums in Florence and saved them from fungal digestion mm-hmm. and oh. was awarded a crystal key to the city. Her name was Hazen. Her last name was Hazen. And she such a, was such an unassuming woman. Mm. She like stayed in her own lab, way in the background. Nobody... Sp- I mean, they spoke to her, of course, because they were being civil, but she was not a high-profile scientist. But from that laboratory came something remarkable. And Margarita Silva Hutner was a wonderful instructor, and uh, I got a lot of uh, wonderful joy out of uh, looking at these fungal infections. So there's just two types of fungi, right? There's ones that eat uh, dead stuff. Those are saprophytic. And all the others are parasitic. Hmm. You've got yeah. no free living fungi. <laughs> they either eat dead stuff or they eat live stuff, but they but they don't produce chlorophyll. They don't. Uh, it, they they can't survive on their own. They must have help. So a very interesting group of organisms, and little understood by the way. They, they, they receive so little attention until you know you develop this weird lung infection that spreads to your liver or something and the next thing you know that oh well, you've got uh, coccidioidomycosis so. mm-hmm. half of the half of the people diagnosed with um, tuberculosis back in the 30s and 40s as soon as there were x-rays half of those people did not have tuberculosis they had histoplasma capsulatum and they didn't have to go to a sanatorium. But when they were sent to the sanatorium, they caught tuberculosis, caught tuberculosis. from the other people. <laughs> right. Right. All right. We have some uh, entries in the, <clears throat> oh, the book. book giveaway. The book. 23 entries, right? 23 <laughs> entries. One for each chromosome. Two people sent in. Um, and these kind of all came in past all week. of a sudden. They came since Sunday. <laughs> all right. So a number of people sent in their incomplete crosswords ah. because we said, yeah, we'll take it. And, and but then I said, <laughs> just write a neurotropic email. And so we right. have those two. So I put them all together. Although, And it turns out that the <laughs> puzzle has a mistake in it. Really? Which, because oh. if you try and do the foamy viruses, uh, the transcription of some gene or some sequence that Ann Palman put in there, you would put in a U, but you need the A to make foamy viruses work. Oh. I, Trudy and I were trying to finish her puzzle. So, yeah. yeah, so I just had this puzzle from ASV 2012, and I threw it up. But, um, <laughs> but it has a mutation. It has a mutation. So if we Well, ever... and, and this year's puzzle had a mutation, <laughs> had a mistake in it too, Ann yeah. said. And she, oh. she said, all those proofreaders, I had to do the puzzle, and nobody found it. So. <laughs> So uh, Islam sent his puzzle, and he said he couldn't finish it. And 29 across, <laughs> orthomyxovirus genus, he said, he, he said those should be influenza, but that doesn't fit. Mm. I don't know what the answer is, but we'll see some other people sent it in. 
Um, he said, I don't want to be in the book contest. No. Uh, I just want to. Because I love us. Twiff. He, loves he said, us. my wife and kids are jealous because they see me restless every Sunday morning until the new episode is out. They know it's Twiff time. Nobody can talk to me until I finish my weekly virology fix. Wow. I look forward to more crosswords. Hmm. Ben is from uh, Matthias Schnell's lab at Thomas Jefferson. I work on rabies, which I suppose is about as neurotropic as you can be. <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> Alan, can you take Benjamin's? Benjamin um, says, years ago, there was an excellent listener pick, Enjoy Your Cells. My children love this four-book educational series, which also includes <laughs> germ zappers, gene machines, and have a nice DNA. <laughs> but now my nine-year-old tells me he wants to study, to study plant biology. Are there any books you would recommend about plant biology that are accessible to children, but go into some interesting depth? Perhaps one of your listeners knows one, or else hmm. would you like to write, or else would like to write one? I've been searching, but starting to suspect such a book does not yet exist. And I think we may need to throw that out to the listeners. Anything on? Yeah, I don't know. Botany, plants. You know, Science Magazine around Christmas comes out with a big list for kids' books. I'm, I'm sorry huh. I didn't save that. Probably fine. I love having nice DNA though. That's, That's yes. a good one. I'm going to buy that. All right, book. listeners, <laughs> tell us if you know of any plant. Uh, books, plant, plant biology books for kids. kids, plant kids. biology for kids. Uh, Patrick sent in an entry. I can never say no to free stuff. <laughs> Carrie loves crosswords, but was months behind and didn't see it. Mm. Uh, let's see. Casey sent in uh, an, an entry. He said it was more difficult than I expected. <laughs> so for, for orthomyxovirus genus, uh, Casey put RNA virus. I'm not sure that's right. Because he has no. no, there are no vertical. There are no verticals on that. It doesn't What's, work. What is eighteen that. down? A uh, French ASV twelve sponsor. You see that Sa- Sanofi Pasteur. Oh, oh, at least S-A-N. that's what Trudy has. So it has to have an S as a second oh, letter. That would be ESA virus then. Yeah, Trudy uh-huh. got that. Cool, ESA virus. <laughs> wow, you guys. Um, Let's see what other here. So I got <laughs> Ashley in Northern Virginia. I don't often listen to podcasts. When I do, I make sure it's Twiv. This <laughs> talks about the puzzle. So Ashley sent in an entry. Um, and then uh, Anthony said that the, the um, it was impossible because the clues were event specific. Event I know, specific. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't realize it would be so event specific. <laughs> uh, ooh. So uh, but they should know they should turn in something for partial credit. I mean, yeah. Yeah, Students from, do that. Uh, well, we're we're adding them. We're adding them in the book drawing anyway right, at this point. Right. So Eric says he he got a uh, a microbiology themed book of crosswords. So that's an interesting idea. Yeah, we could easily wow. do that. Eric. Oh, but Eric writes a lot, and so this is cool. Hmm. He's worked all on neurotropic viruses. I've been applying to grad schools the past four years and never got in, but apparently fifth times the charm. I've been accepted into UMass Med. I'm hoping to meet Jeremy nice. Luban. His work seems cool. really cool. Good oh, for that's you. Wonderful. Yeah, Eric good for you. has good been luck. with us a long time. He he's, he's for way back. I remember when Fantastic. he was an undergrad at UConn. Oh wow! Ryan from Gonzaga University. Mark, he tells us it's neurotrophic, but it's not. No zombies are neurotrophic. <laughs> neurotrophic. <laughs> the title of the book is neurotrophic viruses. Tro- trophic Mal- is going to trophic is eating. Right. Malcolm McRae from University of Warwick. Ian from Plum Island, which is out on Long Island. I didn't know anyone from Plum Island listened. Cool. Yeah. That's a little um, Jack Horner, by the way. A- Kathy, how about, can you take Adams, number 13? Sure. Dear Twivers, I've been with the podcast since the very early days of the show, possibly episode one. <laughs> I don't really remember. It was long enough ago that when I told people I listened to podcasts, they would give me a quizzical look. I'm coming to the end of my postdoc appointment in X. J. Meng's lab right now and looking for the next career step. Just thought I'd throw in my name for the book and make a plug for a microbiology blog I'm starting. Hmm. Microber, uh, there's somebody's, mm-hmm. everybody's name is in there. I can't read it. Okay. <laughs> it's a, it's, there's an error in the URL anyway. <laughs> Blogspot.com. The first post I put up discusses gut viruses using bacteria to hitch a ride to gut cells and facilitate recombination. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Microbe real, M I C R O B E R E E L. I think blogspot.com. It takes you to a car ad. Oh, so really? that's, that's so I think that's not the right URL. Mm. So, all uh, right. Adam, we'd love to pl- plug your blog. It sounds cool. Uh, if you could yeah. send us the URL again, that'd be great. Indeed. Uh, oh, yeah, because he's got blogsplot.com too. So. <laughs> oh, that's maybe that's that's the problem. 
Next one is from Jason, who's at um, UPenn. And he saw he saw Twiv at UPenn. That's when he started listening. He's a postdoc with Paul Lieberman at the Wistar. Love a copy of the book. So so Jason sent in a um, an entry. Um, he got a bunch. What, what did he get? I can't see it. Oh, maybe I can make it bigger. Yeah, he got ESA virus for twenty nine across. Mm-hmm. But a lot of them are blank. You know, you you make an attempt. We'll. We would put you in the contest. Actually, he did pretty well. He he filled out quite a bit of it. That's right. And then uh, Eliana, who's a research assistant in Charlie Rice's lab at Rock, also sent in, because she heard Kathy say we could send in our incomplete puzzles. So she sent in a couple. We have Ken Rogers from University of Louisiana. There you go. Morgan from Seattle, Washington. Found immune originally and then started listening. Oh, Dixon. That's LSU, by the way. Which? The University of Louisiana at Lafayette. That's LSU? LSU, yeah. What's, what's, you said, said the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Yeah, that's what it's written here. I don't know that university. Okay. Interesting. I would have sent in a blank puzzle and said all my virus answers are latent. <laughs> so, Dixon, uh, yes. on TWIP, someone said... Um, ASCP, it stands for the American Society for Clinical Pathology, right. not clinical parasitology, which someone said on TWIP. Oh, I didn't say that. And there is a University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Really? Yes. That's interesting. Matthew Bates is at which University. Is, which is just right. louisiana.edu, by the way. So they mm. kind of got the flagship domain there. Probably yeah. darned. And I remember listening to the TWIP and hearing the American Society of Clinical Parasitology and thinking, eh, no, I don't think that's no, right. No, no, <laughs> did no, you say that, Dixon? Not. I don't think I did. Thus misspake de Pommier. <laughs> I hope I didn't say that. I certainly didn't mean to say that. Maybe it was Daniel. <coughs> we could blame him. It's possible. Uh, Matthew Bates sent in an entry from University of Lincoln. Mm-hmm. Wait, that's Lincolnshire. That must be UK, right? Lincolnshire. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's in, Ooh, do you right. know that, uh, Rich? No. But it's Lancashire. It's, again, it's got a, it's know, got a typical a UK That's uh, right. postal code there. Correct. Yeah. Fabian from Germany, who works yep. on chikungunya. Uh, weather is cold and rainy. Shouldn't have moved to no- northern Germany again. <laughs> <laughs> he works at the Twin Core Institute. See that. Just change the N to Ev and it'd be V. I yeah. mean, it'd be a Twin <laughs> Core. Twin Core. <laughs> right. Niraj. Sends in attempt number 000-00-0001. David sent in 21. He said, I had no time to do a crossword. (laughs) Carrie uh, listens to Twip Twivo and Twim. She loves it. Quality educational entertainment. Kimberly is from, ooh, this is a new one, uh, Howard Hughes Janelia Research Camp. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. She is the manager of virus services. Goodness. At the Janelia campus. So but, if you're if you're in Virginia, I guess it is. Yeah. And Virginia. you're looking for a virus, Kimberly can say <laughs> exactly. So those are the twenty three. Let's do a random Oh my. Number generator dot com. A number between one and twenty three, right? Mm-hmm. Are we ready? Mm-hmm. Okay, generate number five. Number five. Ta da five. Who's the winner? Who's number five? <coughs> Casey. 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 The winner. Okay. Casey, send us your, or send Congrats. to twiv at microbe.tv. Send us your address. And, and what is um, the they win? Oh, I forgot. Your the neurotropic <laughs> virus. Neur- neurotropic right. viruses. <laughs> it's up here. And, and Casey did, he was the one who sent in the, puzzle that's on the google doc so yep okay he actually tried the puzzle too so it's good all right and um it's 3 40 what time did we start to okay so we need to go to picks yeah we should go to picks very right. good because uh, we don't want to go on forever you know let me let me tell you something that apple just started releasing metrics detailed metrics on podcast behavior go on and they how is our podcast behaving well I couldn't find Twiv or the only one I could find was Twivo and there's some it's 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 a beta so they're bugs but I found Twivo and you can see uh, what point most people stop listening ah mm. and on Twivo so far it looks like they stopped just before the picks oh so I'm going to see that for Twiv because if nobody listens to picks we shouldn't do them right why should right. we pick 
Why should we pick? <laughs> Alan, what, do you, what did you pick? <laughs> uh, what I picked, which I guess maybe nobody will hear, um, <laughs> is the I, sound don't, of re- silence. I don't recall whether I've picked Jay Rosen's Press Think blog before, but um, if I haven't, then that in general, but this specific post in particular. Uh, Jay Rosen is a professor of journalism at NYU and a very deep thinker about the state of journalism right now and a really good writer about it. If you work in journalism or science communication, you should already have this in your in your regular feeds. And if you are just interested in the state of journalism as it is, this is really, really interesting reading. Mm. Um, so the post that I picked is, uh, he calls it Show Your Work, the New Terms for Trust in Journalism. And the issue that that is at the core of this is, you know, people increasing, well, people distrust journalism that's been a long-running thing but even more so now when there's all this propaganda being pumped out to tell people that they should mistrust journalism and so in the age of presidents shouting fake news every time something is unflattering to them how do you as a as a journalist or as a publication establish trust for your readers to understand that you really are trying to get at the truth and he lays out what he sees as the right approach, which is basically transparency. It's, it's show your data. Hmm. Um, and this is probably good advice for scientists who should already be following it. You know, you should show your data and say where your results came from. But, um, hmm. but also he's, he's got a section on talking frankly about the limitations of our knowledge. You know, what do we know and what don't we know about a news event or about a topic? And explain how you got that information. And ideally, if it's based on a large collection of data, allow people to see the data and analyze it for themselves. Nice. It's great. Okay. Yeah, but I have alternate facts for you. <laughs> right. So it, 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 is, it is very much, you know, here's, here's our effort at finding the truth. Here's how we did it. Right. And if you if you have a different take on us, help us investigate further. Yeah. I think it's great. I think but, it's a really good take. But, you know, the people reading it are, you know, not the ones that should be people, reading it, right? Yeah, this, they're the this, choir. <laughs> uh, this is a very influential blog. Is it? This, yeah. is, this is people in the newsrooms who are making decisions about how to tell the news. and And I think he's... Providing a tremendous service here. Do you think Fox News reads this? <laughs> well, no. They they have a very different business model. It's not news, actually. It's <laughs> no. Right? It's no. It's just um, you can their their business model was presented by George Orwell as the what is it the two minutes hate. That's right. Right. So every you put something on the screen that riles everybody up and they shout right. at it. Correct. Mm-hmm. And that's Fox News, and they have an audience for that, and they're gonna. They're going to have advertisers who convince these people to, I don't know, buy gold when it's about to crash or whatever. And um, that's that's how they make their money. And Roger Ailes built a multi-billion dollar empire out of it. But that's not the business of journalism. Yeah. No, my, my respect for journalism is any newspaper or publication that's willing to fire some for contriving the truth. Sure. And the Times has had a run of those people, unfortunately, and they've fired every each and every one of them. Of course. Mm-hmm. So if you're not willing to fire them, it means you 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 let them go on and doing it because they're obviously succeeding in mm-hmm. selling newspapers. Alan, did you know Jay Rosen when you were at NYU? I did not. No. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I've always trusted journalism. I was brought up to yeah. believe in it, and I know that bad things have happened. Yeah. But of course. I think we need it, as yeah. we heard earlier. That's right. Sure. This That's is right. great. I'm going to put this in my feed. Do you remember when uh, Truman and Dewey were running against each other? And yeah. the headline in the yeah. newspaper read, Dewey that wins. Was a, that was a polling error. <laughs> but still. Yeah, so the other, another nice thing about um, the Press Think blog, it's not a high-volume blog. So you'll, I mean, mm. I'll yeah. forget that I have it in my feed, and it's been a month or more. Mm-hmm. And then I get one of these that's just a really deep dive, and I say, wow, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, good for that. Right. Rich Condit. Real simple. I have uh, <laughs> a Times 360 Lego factory tour. Uh, I wanted to see <laughs> if this had been um, picked before, so I looked up Lego on the Twiv picks, and this is part of the Lego arc 
Lego in some form or another has been picked 12 times before. But this is uh, the Times does these 360 things where you can pan a, a video that you can pan around with with your mouse. Mm. And it's just a two minute uh, video on a Lego factory tool. I they make a lot of cool. pieces a second. They make a lot of pieces. My God. I thought the most interesting part about it was that they have robots that take the bins full of pieces and store them. And they, they store them in a random fashion. Just any empty slot, and they stick them there, but they remember where it was. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Not so random. <laughs> and it reminds me of, you know, the way, you know, I, I'm i all organized. My email, I'm always filing stuff into folders and stuff, but that's actually old-fashioned. Right. You know, now you just search. Do a search. Right? Right. For what that's, you want. that's exactly right. That's how Amazon's warehouse works, too. Yeah. Yeah. Everything lots, is just uh, everywhere, but they've got a database that connects it. <laughs> so we had, our kids had lots of Legos, right? And now they're like all in one big box. And my wife says, just sell them. I said, no, I want to go sort them out. And she said, you're at home. <laughs> I said, when I have time one day. <laughs> one year. I want to sort them into their individual things and sell them as sets. But that's ridiculous. I should just sell them as pieces, right? Yes. Because <laughs> I don't want to. Well, part of, this, part of this Lego tour is about uh, the, the staff that creates new Lego things. And I... Right. You know, if if you were a Lego freak, working at the Lego factory would be your dream job because they got these designers mm. and they've just got a big room that has every Lego piece every May ever made in any color. And you can sit there and play with them and make up a new Lego thing. That's your job. Yeah. So, Kathy, are there virus Legos? I know you can make I yours, but do they? No, ever- I don't know. Hmm. Because I've seen yeah. people build their own virus Legos, right? Yeah, okay. But, but I've never seen a yeah. kit. They should make a kit with viruses yeah. in them, right? I can't yeah. imagine that they have. They wrote they them once to try to get them to make a, a, a vertical farm Lego, but uh, hmm. they got that no responses. Yeah, that would be good. Maybe I'll try it again now that it's more popular. Dixon, what do you have? I have the future <laughs> of the built environment. <laughs> I'm serious about this. I really am. Uh, the, the, the background on this is that when I was in... Um, Singapore, about three years ago, as a judge for a competition between 10 universities selected from around the world to meet there to reinvent the way the built environment behaves, uh, which was kind of far-reaching, sponsored by a very rich Chinese uh, who had money to burn on the subject and wanted to find out what the youth of uh, the world thought. I encountered a woman, Marilyn Taylor, uh, who was at that point the uh, chairman of the uh, the architecture and design school at the University of Pennsylvania. And we left the country together by going out to the airport. And she said, welcome to my world. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, "I, when I was an architect and practicing, I designed this terminal. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow. And what a terminal. It had everything fantastic it was just an amazing place and she said if i had met you before i designed this i would have included food production inside and then they could have been producing stuff all over so i said i bet you someday i bet you someday that someone's going to design a 3d printer to make a skyscraper and we're and now this is a youtube to watch a 3d printer make a house and I can tell you that this is going to advance very fast, and you're going to have skyscrapers being made autonomously by computers. Speaking of Lego, <laughs> what do you? Uh, what's the advantage of doing that? The advantage is that you can make them in any size, shape, or form, as long as it conforms to an yeah. um, an engineering uh, standard. Is it cheaper than conventional? Much. I mean, come on! You don't need any cranes or workers or anything else. You just feed material in, and up it goes, right? So imagine a 3D printer for a skyscraper that gets up to the top and stops and stays there. And now the building needs repair. The thing goes right back down again, repairs it, goes back up again. Or you want to change the facade. Or you want to, you know, it has so many potential that that we're totally, and she looked at me like I was crazy. The next year I sent her a um, a YouTube of the first printed house. This is an, an advanced printed house. And so they're doing, you know, they sent a 3D printer up to the space station. Mm. They use print their tools up there. They don't. They don't carry them up anymore. It's too too expensive. Yes, I think Kate Rubin's mentioned that. <clears throat> she said they are using a centrifuge rotor 
that had been 3D printed. They exactly. stuck it on. They stuck it on the end of a drill. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they they do still carry a lot of their tools. The, the 3D printing technology is maturing. Yes, I would say that's true. Spin I, that's exactly it. right. By the way, um, Thomas Edison <laughs> tried this back in the early part of the 20th century. He he started a company to make poured concrete homes that they would mold the entire home. Oh, interesting. And just pour the concrete in the top. Ha. And there are, there are a few of these still standing. It was a complete <laughs> flop because the, no the intended. <laughs> process of doing it was way too complicated and it was just way too cheap to build out of wood and conventional construction. But yeah. this is a obviously a much more updated version of the concept. Right. And I predict now also, my question is, again. um, how do they do the plumbing fixtures and the wiring? No, I think that's handwork. I think once you get the shell of it made, you have to go back in. Because that's that the stuff. expensive part. Well, I would agree. And the time-consuming mm -hmm. part, too. But at least right. you're enclosed inside of a building and you can work. And it can go up in a matter of days, basically. Right. Okay. All right. Kathy, what do you have? Well, I picked something that I was drawn to because of a picture that was printed in the New York Times of the Great Lakes and it was visualized by the uh, Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectroradiometer, M-O-D-I-S. And in the New York Times, it was black and white. So then I, th in the printed paper, so then I went online and it was black and white. And then somehow I managed to find the false colored version that they referred to in the New York Times. And it's on this NASA site. And so the link takes you to the January 11th picture of the Great Lakes where the uh, snow and ice are blue and the clouds are white. And so you see the patterns on the Great Lakes. And then Lake Erie is mostly covered with ice. So there's not as much clouds, not as many clouds over that. Mm. But then over on the left is the images for different days. And, and I don't actually know how you get further back other than to just uh, – print in put in the date in the url mm -hmm. but you can go back at least to january 27th um and there are all different things like fires burning in new south wales and uh, there was another yeah. one fire fires burning in the southeast yeah on january 31st wow. so uh, a lot of, a lot just of fires look at them yeah tell me about yeah it. yeah and just interesting stuff but i was drawn there because of the great cool. lakes of it's course cool. yeah. nice. it is. I like it. Beautiful. Satellites. What you can do with satellites. Yeah. Great stuff. Yes. I have two short picks. One is a uh, editorial in Science Magazine that Dixon gave me just yesterday. It's by Rush Holt, who is the chief executive of AAAS, um, former politician, actually. Right. That's right. Tried, we tried to get him on TWIV when we did that episode in D.C., remember, uh -huh. at the March, but he was busy. Right. It's called The Tale of Two Cultures. It's why um, scientists need to communicate. Right. You know, science is great. Our lives are great because of it. The public is increasingly distrustful. And he said it's up to scientists to build trust. If scientists fail to rebuild the public's understanding and appreciation, this could indeed our become fault. the worst of times. What was yes, that? Sir. If we fail, it's our fault that the public turns yeah. against us. I don't know if, are these editorials uh, open access? Does anyone? They are. I think they are. Yes. Yeah. You could just click on this. Yes. Excellent. Uh, and the other one is a similar idea. This was in nature and, and uh, Islam Hussein sent it along. Why science blogging still matters. Blogs continue to be an effective platform for communicating your science to major mm -hmm. stakeholders and the public, with which I would completely agree. I never thought it was not mattering because um, a lot of people still blog, and it's really good. It's exactly. great for communicating. It's great to hone your writing, right? Exactly right. If you like writing, yep. <laughs> well, it'd be better. Even if you hate writing, this is a way to learn it. Right. But I, I, I always say, start a blog, you know, find something to say. Exactly. And po polish your writing and tell us. We're happy to promote it, such as we had today. You know, we're happy to help you get uh, an audience here. And I just love it. I think writing is great. But I also like talking. No. And there are people who like to read, <laughs> and there are people who like to listen. And there's some people who do both, right? You have downtime, and it's fun to listen to things that are interesting. And I guess I find a wonderfully crafted blog, <clears throat> like the one Alan just recommend it's just yep. wonderful yep. and if it's nicely laid out so it's easy on your eyes 
Man, that's great. That's great. We have a listener pick from Jolene, uh, who sent us our our snippet today. Yep. Immune Quest, a game to help with learning the immune system. <laughs> My experience, both teaching and as a student, students need every bit of help they can to get to understand the terms, jargon, and interconnections within the immune system. Recent paper in the Journal of Microbiology and Biology Education describes a small study where they used it in a class. I have not tried the game, but I probably will at my next opportunity. Anyone else tried it yet? Has anyone played Immune Quest? I feel like I tried this. It looks familiar. And it was a few years ago, and it was interesting. And, <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like I played a little bit of this. I didn't go through the whole thing, but I, I mm. think I tried this game. Looks pretty sophisticated. Yes. Yeah, they got, like an, fun, they got an NSF grant. Um to do this and it's uh the student comments in the paper uh they did a wordle and the <laughs> the the word that was used the most was frustrating <laughs> uh, hmm. uh, the, that's describing okay. the game or immunology <laughs> uh describing i think it was describing the game yeah hmm. let's see i haven't anyone yeah. uh have experience with it let us know if so that would help I mean, with every discovery of a t-cell subset this game changes tremendously <laughs> yeah this the student comments said something about you know it's uh it was useful for the first two levels the third level was hard to beat because there were too many upgrades right. and it seems like it uh, it's exactly. like starts easy sucks you in and gets hard really fast yeah okay something. and then you die <laughs> but, yeah. and you die so oh but but here's one student says yes it tricked me into learning <laughs> <laughs> no that's what that's what you want to do perfect right? and it's yeah good. And was way easier than journal articles or some other assignment. <laughs> so I'm heading to Drexel next week. On Tuesday, I'm going to be speaking with a faculty member who developed a game called CD4 Hunter. Oh. Hmm. And she, um, the, she, she and people in her lab developed it, Sandra Urdaneta. And, and it's all about trying to kill CD4 cells with HIV particles. So we're going to do a a podcast and she's going to explain the game. And so that should be fun. Look for that. I don't know when it'll come out, but it'll be our first gaming to live since viruses and video games. Episode number seven. Dixon. That was a, yeah. Long time ago with your, with your son here. That's right. Twiv is at Apple podcasts, microbe.tv slash Twiv. And you can send us your questions and comments to twiv at microbe.tv. And if you want to support us, you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a few ways to do that. And we thank everyone who's done it. It's really great. And I want to thank everyone who has today and tirelessly for many, many years participated. Dixon, uh-oh, <laughs> someone's coughing outside the door. <laughs> That's right. It's the immune system fighting back. <laughs> Dixon de Palmier is at parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thanks, Dixon. You're welcome. Was your class good today? It was excellent. We had a lot of fun. The sun is uh We talked about the, 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 the true meaning of sustainability. Oh. <laughs> what is the true meaning of sustainability? You'd have to ask a politician. No. <laughs> it depends on your time frame. And that's, okay. what, we laid, that's what we laid down. I, I showed galactic eco, ecological process first as the longest term sustainable thing. I said nothing is forever. Here's the proof. <laughs> right. And took it right down to the solar constant, which is two calories per square centimeter per minute. Do they like and that varies. About that sort of thing? They loved it. They absolutely okay. loved it. That's good. Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Rich Condit is an emeritus <clears throat> professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Rich, we had a um, an email to TWIP, and it mentioned you. Oh, was it TWIP? Wait, is it TWIV? No, it can't be TWIV, because it was on a podcast, and I, oh, it was TWIM. And I said, this nobody's going to know what this means. Here, TWIM170, uh, here it is. All right, so this is from someone named Noah. Okay. Just into the arc of... <laughs> He says at the end, P.S., when I was first listening, imagine how disappointed I was when I went to R2208 ARB and Dr. Condit was no, nowhere to be found. Right. What does that mean? That was my old office number. 
Oh, okay. So you must, this guy must have been at Gainesville and came looking for you. He heard the podcast. He came looking for you and you had retired. Yep. R2208. That was my office. Wonderful office for 25 years. Noah. Anyway, Noah went to the Peace Corps, worked in Cambodia. Neat. Good for him. Okay. (laughs) A lot of dengue over there, I can tell you that. Yeah, there is a lot of dengue. Alan Dove blogs at turbidplaque.com. And you can also find him in, on Twitter, Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I blog at virology.ws. And people always say, why WS? But it also works if you West type Samoa. <laughs> in virology.blog. <laughs> right. But not virology.pizza. That doesn't work. No. I didn't buy that. I, I didn't buy that. I didn't think, <laughs> well, maybe I should get everybody. <laughs> Perhaps. ASM does help us a bit. We thank them for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for his music, ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>